Hi, everybody. How's it going? And welcome to the Brett to Feed podcast. I'm here with my buddy, Jeff Gullovich, known as Gully. How are you, bud? I'm awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Right on. All right. So for those who don't know uh, Jeff Gullovich, he has been a staple in the mountain bike scene forever, starting um, very young to be in the movies and has moved on um, in his career to to be a competitor in both slope style and free ride events like Rampage. Um, I think uh, I think you uh, culminated and maxed out at uh, a fifth in Rampage and a fifth that same year in the Joyride Slope Style at Crankworks Whistler, and um, have uh, worked on to, uh, having a successful um, YouTube page and Instagram uh, site and whatnot. And so you're like a, an influencer, free rider, content creator. What are you? Who are you? Tell us who you are. I need to start by saying I hate the term influencer for what we do because <laughs> uh, I'm a mountain biker. I like to ride cool things and uh, I work with GoPro. So it makes it very easy for me to create content. But ideally, I just call myself a free ride mountain biker. Okay. Or uh, I've heard other people call you as GoPro Gully. <laughs> I've heard that also. <laughs> yeah. I always call you when I have like GoPro uh, tech tips or not tips, but the questions and you always have the answers like in your brain right away. You're not the only one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like most days I have uh, tech questions about GoPros and then like that's almost become part of my job as well. Yeah. And it's, it's just fun. Like those guys give me an amazing uh, skill set to use and I enjoy doing it as well. So it, it goes hand in hand quite well. Yeah. Well, the GoPro is amazing thing these days. I, I remember back in the day, we had like giant film cameras that were strapped to our helmets and they were like loud. And you started early enough. You might have used one of the, some of those too. Back I was in the there. Day. I'm yeah. pretty sure it stunted my growth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. How loud were those things, eh? Ridiculous. Yeah. If you're running the 8 mil or the 16 mil on the side of your helmet, it's just buzzing away. And yeah. then uh, Digger was actually using like the handheld digital cameras. And it wasn't any better, but it was a little lighter. Yeah. Yeah. So it went from like eight pounds of excessive weight on your neck down to, <laughs> down to five. So way better. Yeah. I, I honestly think uh, wearing helmet cams at a young age, like 13, I started wearing them for videos. I think it actually uh, affected my growth. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But you were going big at a young age and um, you know, did, was it 13 when you started, you said? Yeah, I think I was so in my bigger? first... Uh, That's when I first saw you. Yeah, I think that was my first uh, North Shore Extreme. I was 13. What number was it? Ooh, six. Number six. I believe. Because, yeah. like, you know, there's the famous scene. Like, you're, you're jumping off this and riding that and whatnot. But then um, the first time I saw you is when you did some hawk. And then I think you nutted yourself. And then you're like, oh, you're holding the jewels. And you're like, I think I went too big. <laughs> yeah, and Connor McLeod following me. Oh yeah. And we, it was just this little cliff drop we were shooting. It was like 14, 15 feet and we did a line into it and I hadn't started from that far back yet. So I was just mocking in this thing. Yeah. Completely clear the landing and I'm going straight for these two trees that I cannot thread. And literally last second, I just dove off the bike, front wheel hits the tree and I just nutted myself to all hell. And I think my voice went a little bit higher that day. But <laughs> all in all, it was it was the lesser of two evils to jump off the bike as opposed to hit that tree dead on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that saying? If you lose your left ball, is your right ball still your right ball? <laughs> it's your ball left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, luckily, I still have both. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Hey, what did one ball say to the other ball? Uh, what's hanging? <laughs> <laughs> How come we got to hang? Slim did the shooting. <laughs> <laughs> oh man wow so early early north shore extreme movies and um you know i think you, you were in every one since then number six right up to ten yeah and um you were you were like raised in the north shore and so you know like a local it's just your backyard and um you made it a career but uh starting so young people seem to think you've been around forever because you have been around since forever but you just started young yeah it's, it's, I've been, it's been 21 years in front of the camera. Wow. Yeah. More than half my life. Yeah. Yeah. So that's amazing. It, it has been pretty cool. And like riding with people like yourself, like 
Simmons, Thomas, Richie, like have all become good friends of mine. And like, you guys were the guys I looked up to growing up and Aww. I still do, but at the same time, I'm taller than you now. So I look yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> Especially on Richie. We all, we all looked out on Richie. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say about that guy at least he doesn't look down on people yeah for sure it's, much, it's a little warmer down there though yeah 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 <laughs> oh my god uh so like um which who of your buddies have, have uh you know flown the mountain bike flag high and whatnot and 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 you've made it you know as a pro you're an established pro you're sponsored you're traveling around the world and um you've done some great things in competition and in free riding um but you know everyone has those buddies that they shred with you know who are rippers but they haven't followed the same path you know like fraser is one of them i believe and totally. and, and who, shiggy, who, shiggy uh, ross sick, measures sick rider. um yeah those are three really good friends of mine like our our entire riding group was so deeply involved in mountain biking that most of my friends still work in the industry and they're my go-to riding buddies like they are phenomenal riders yeah so it, it's pretty crazy to see like everybody took a little hiatus in their early 20s to get a job and figure out how to pay for these bikes because they're not cheap. Yeah. And um, yeah, so a handful of them took a couple of year hiatus, but uh, literally all of my friends I grew up riding with are back into biking. That's cool. It is really cool. Yeah. And did you have to like drag anyone kicking in and screaming back in or they're all, they're all just motivated? All willingly. Yeah. Like totally. one by one, they were getting back into it. And uh, when we couldn't hang out on Saturdays and Sundays because we were biking, more and more people just snowballed back in yeah. and it's been so cool because now we have a little rat pack back together and yeah, it's like Saturday, Sunday rides. And then I ride the other five days also, but it's nice to see the boys out there. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're always riding. I love it. Now your new passion um, is skiing. Like I, I know that you've, uh, you've been a snowboarder and we've snowboarded, you know, some great days and you know, you're obviously very athletic and good at it, but you jumped on the skis and you're kind of nerding out there for a little bit, but I just saw you, you came back from Micah heli ski and you're shredding the trees on your skis. I'm obsessed. Like I, I love snowboarding and nothing will change that. But when I got into uh split boarding, I hated it. Like the board didn't feel the same. It uh, it's like two or three extra steps in your transitions uh, when you're traversing or on your approach and your exit, like you're, you have loose heels and it feels like you're on snow blades. <laughs> and, and, uh, my wife showed interest in picking up skiing. So I figured I'd do it with her. But, uh, during the winter when the trails were all snowed in, even on the crappy days, I'd just go ski by myself and just like learn the techniques. And, and then I started going with better and better people. And they were passing off their knowledge to me and just quickly progressed. Like being able to go up, if it was still a good day in bounds, then I'd bring my board. If it was a crappy day, I'd bring my skis and just teach myself to ski in crappy conditions. Cause if you can do it well there, you can apply it to anything. Like just like mountain biking, yeah. Like riding here on the shore, it's the probably the gnarliest crap out there. And we go to other places around the world and we're good to go. You can handle it. Totally. Yeah. You've seen greaser, you've seen sketcher, you've seen jankier. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, that that exact idea kind of uh, transitioned from snowboarding into skiing. Just like you can side hill better, there's less steps for um, transition when you're when you're ski touring, um, and it's a very similar position to mountain biking. You literally just turn your hands from a flat bar vertically to your poles, and you're in the same position more or less. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just so fun, dude. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know what? I don't know if I'm honestly a mountain biker that snowboards or a snowboarder that mountain bikes. Like, if I like, I'm split right down the middle with equal love for both. You right. know what? That's a good problem to have. That is a good problem to have. Yeah. 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 First of all, problems here. You sound like you're complaining, and I don't like it. <laughs> I want to be shredding right today. Yeah, let's go. No. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Bye, everybody. We're going shredding. No. <laughs> and they. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the shortest podcast ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now one thing with shredding all the time actually is um is your body takes a good beating sometimes you know like not just from like crashes and whatnot but from like you know constant use and whatnot you know i'm old so i'm feeling it more than you will you'll 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 see one day i'll get there but uh you know how how has your body held up o over 21 years of of uh filming extreme sports i feel like i've been pretty fortunate i'm gonna go ahead and knock on some wood right now but um, yeah, I've I've dealt with 
serious injuries. I've been through some life-threatening circumstances, um, but overall been very fortunate through my career. And I feel like everybody goes through a career altering injury at one point in their life. And that kind of weeds out all the young guns that come up and uh, to those who are going to continue to succeed. Like around, I'd say 18 to 22, everybody has a uh, an injury that makes them question their their career choice. And for my for me, mine was my kneecap. I broke my kneecap. I was out for eight months. It was a bad break. Um, Co bikes dropped me. A lot of my sponsors dropped me. Uh, shout out to Co bikes. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, after determination through the physio, the recovery period coming back, I'm like the, the kneecap's not a good one to break. That's like the doctor said, I wouldn't be able to ride at the same level again ever. And um, eight and a half months later, got back on the bike and just started training again. And I was lucky enough to have Simmons and Andreas Hustler vouch for me at Rocky Mountain and give me a second chance. And I basically started my career over again. How did you break your kneecap? It was a stupid crash. It was Canada Day, 18 years old. We were watching the Elevation BMX comp at Whistler, and I was doing laps with uh, Ross Measures. And I was wearing the 661 soft um, Kyle Strait knee pads. Uh, this isn't Kyle's fault. He didn't, he didn't do this here. But uh, yeah, I just had a stupid fall on freight train. There's like that kind of rock spine move after you pass the, uh, the chairlift that you can go down to Creekside from. Yeah. And on this rock move, there's a little transfer you could do. I overshot and I got pitched off the rock and fell about 12 feet down, striking a tree while I was falling and just landed in the rocks and some, and I was like, well, I can't believe I'm all right after that and tried to stand up and my, my leg just gave out. And, um, I took off my knee pad and my kneecap was missing. Oh, and gross. the, yeah, like the, the muscles and ligaments had pulled it apart from the impact. So I had the bottom half of my kneecap in my upper shin and the top half of my kneecap was uh lower thigh. Whoa. It was, it was gnarly, man. It was like, I went into shock immediately. Yeah. And luckily, um, Darcy Wittenberg of all people was the next person down the trail. So he called the, uh, the meat wagon wow. and then Ross and him <clears throat> helped me walk out of there to the road. And I got uh ride down the hill and I was in surgery the next morning. It was nuts. That's gnarly. Yeah. And so what do they do? They they have to like zip tie your kneecap back together? More or less. Yeah. yeah. They, they opened it up. So it was about a, I don't know, probably like a 20 centimeter incision vertically down across my kneecap. They pulled the two pieces back together, two screws, two wires, and then uh, staple it up. Yeah. And I still have the hardware in there. Oh, do you really? Yeah. Like I, I can tell you. Uh, you never said this off at the airport that I know of. No, no, it's, I, I don't know if it's titanium or what they use, but never had an issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. When you go through the x-ray machine, they're like, oh, got some hardware in the knee. Eh? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Do I ever. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> How long you got to hear a story? <laughs> <laughs> but no, still there. Um, yeah. So, but uh, it never made you question uh, what you're doing. No, no, no. I, um, ever since I started biking around 11. 12 i was just like i love this 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 is what i want to do like i I snowboarded younger and definitely couldn't afford base layers or proper outerwear and i was like do you know how cold it is out here (laughs) like i am not a snowboarder (laughs) i'm going biking (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh wow so um your collarbone it looks like it's sticks up pretty good too. You've done your collarbones. Oh yeah. Back to injury lists. Um, yeah, I have a fourth degree separation in my left collarbone. Yeah. And that's another crazy story. Uh, tagged this one, this one jump, at Jordy Lund's event, the jump ship. Yeah. Got tossed to the flat bottom on cement, uh, tore all the ligaments that hold, uh, the clavicle in place. And because I severed everything clean, it uh, was swelling management and I was riding literally three days later. What? Yeah. Cause uh, you sever everything and there's no uh, nerves connecting anymore. So it doesn't hurt. And so they never rejoin. No. And like getting it fixed right now is just cosmetic. So yeah, I don't really care. And that's on the, your right side. 
left side. On your left side. Yeah. I'm, I'm married. She can't leave me now. <laughs> Please don't leave me, babe. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to the beach again. <laughs> oh, that's, that's one thing that everybody and their dog point out when they, uh, when they see me without a tarp on, they're like, Hey, you got this collarbone. I'm like, cool. That's a, it's a fantastic observation. <laughs> What did you do to your other one? The other one sticks up good too. No, the other one's just uh, sick muscles. Oh strong. yeah, oh yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> traps, man. Yeah, the no right one's fine. Uh, left one, uh, that's that's old pokey right there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That sticks up good. Yeah, yeah, mine does that too on my left side, but not as good as yours. But uh, yeah, way better. I know. I used to look at yours and go, Ugh! yeah, you don't want to know. And that. now, now I've done it, and I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm just like golly. <laughs> But I've kind of done both. So this one kind of sticks up a little bit and that one sticks up a little bit where like my shoulder horns. You got to match it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's metricality. Absolutely. Oh God. <laughs> but the rest of your body, that, those are the major ones that you've done on your body? Those are the major ones. Um, I've done my radius and ulna in one go. Uh, I have a couple of compressed vertebrae. Um, I've broken my right tib, my right talus and my ankle. I've had deep bone bruisings in both ankles from jumping off your bike from high elevation for some stupid reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fingers. God, what else? I've broken my nose. Um, stitches, like hundreds of stitches. Uh, like when you're first were riding with flat pedals, like growing up, you slip that and you just open up your, uh, your shin every other day kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, you're back in the, the clinic and they're like, Oh, Oh, First good. name basis. Yeah, good thing we still have the old fish hook here that we didn't put away from last visit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, you know how it goes. Like, oh yeah, and I've had hundreds of stitches as well. Definitely. I, I, you know my. <laughs> I'd go to the hospital in Calvis, and they thought my parents were abusing me just because I'd come in battered and bruised and shot, and they eventually just learned who I was. And oh, Brett's here again. <laughs> yeah, get his get his coffee mug out. Yeah, he's back. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so you've got a bunch of tattoos now. Mm -hmm. Um. Have have you had to uh, have any issues like cutting through the tattoos and, and trying to line up the artwork and everything? Um, no, because no. now now you you didn't have to tattoos then when you were like you know learning the craft and cutting yourself and climbing your climbing your way up in in the in the mountain bike world. But um, you've got some 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 artwork there. Mm -hmm. So are are you ever uh, concerned with like ruining the artwork more than hurting yourself? No, it's. Everything, every piece I get is like a little bit of a story. Yeah. So if you were to cut it up or anything, it's just adding to the story. Like okay. I've, I've never been concerned about it. Like I, I have all traditional style tattoos, so they're pretty blunt lines and uh, wider, um, I guess, more simple graphics. Yeah. And yeah, I've never gone in for touch-ups or anything. It's just, it's an ongoing story. Yeah. Like. I more often than not, like I, I wear long sleeves cause I don't really want to talk about them with people. I don't know. Yeah. They're like, Oh, what does this mean? And you're like, it's an owl, dude. <laughs> I like owls. <laughs> it, it means I like owls. <laughs> it's, it, it's a superb owl. Yeah. I bought the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Snowing out. <laughs> I don't know. It's just been fun. Like I've, I've known since I was pretty young that uh, I like tattoos and wanted to get them. And I started on my back and that quickly creeped to my arms and, um, the arms didn't hurt that much. So I just went nuts, got my arms done, like just piece by piece, like no massive pieces that cover the entire thing. What was the most painful spot? Um, I'd say the outside of your pec near your armpit. Really? Yeah. Cause it's a sensitive area in here. And, uh, like, I guess the inside of your arm too, like near your armpit again, it's just a sensitive area. And like that, um, it felt like they're just digging a, a hot blade into your, your arm. And that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like the rest of the arms were, were chill. Oh, and wow. so I just went nuts on those. And then I moved to my torso and stomach wasn't that great either. Stomach hurts, but, uh, you basically, you need to just find a happy place stay hydrated and eat some food because your body just goes through adrenaline so quickly. Yeah. Like a two hour session is great. The yeah. longest I've sat for is eight. And eight I, hours? Yeah. I don't need to do that again. Oh my God. No, it's yeah. That's the day after. And my, the same artist just giving her. Um, yeah. I'm not sitting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely change up my artists. Like I have one go-to guy and then if I want like little pieces or like someone else's style, 
then I might go get one of their pieces, but only for that reason. Who's your go-to guy? Uh, his name's Justin Cox at Funhouse Tattooing. Okay. And he's a badass. Yeah. Like so good, so sharp, and he's really fun to talk shit with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> we sit there for two, three hours and it actually feels like it cruises by just because we have a good time talking. Yeah, And yeah. he's like the most badass looking dude ever, like fully, fully covered, like head, face, hands, everything and he's just like hey want to go snowboarding later this week like i do <laughs> <laughs> and it's rad to hang out with him too like he's he's actually a homie so yeah yeah it's it's good to build those relationships and he's he's a great dude like i if i ever have uh a snowboard gear or jackets that fit him i hook him up and then he hooks me up with with uh work time so yeah. it it's rad to see yeah you know, it's the, the giving that keeps on giving yeah <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever shared any tattoo artists with uh, Jordy Lund? Have you guys ever? Um... Yeah, his his brother Craig has tattooed both of us, and then um, at Government Street Tattoos, where Craig works now, uh, another guy named Johnny Murdoch. Uh, we both had work done by him as well. Okay. And then beyond that, I think I said no when Jordy was trying to do stick and poke tattoos at Retallic during uh, Sorgi's Fest series. Stick and poke tattoos like like jailhouse like worse than jailhouse like gnarlier than jailhouse. I would say uh, jailhouse style uh, with less perfection. Oh my god! <laughs> and and what was he trying to? Oh, he got Aggie. He he tattooed the um, <laughs> the inside of Aggie's bottom lip at Retallic, and there's just twenty dudes standing around being like. Well, I want to film this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. And I was just like, nah, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks, no, thanks, Dirty. Yeah. Oh, what a legend. Yeah. You got to you gotta appreciate his enthusiasm. Yeah. And it's just another legend of George. Like, he is one of a kind. Yeah. Yeah. They broke the mold there. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. So, the, the Fest series, um, that's another thing that you've done besides, you know, Soap Style and, and Rampage is... is the giant jumps of, of um, the Fest series with, with your homies. Yeah. You know, like, who actually started it? Was it Sorgi <laughs> and Aggie and um, uh, who else? Uh, Nico Vink. Nico Vink. Andreo. Um, I think uh, Kyle Jamison was involved. Oh, yes. Yeah. It was a bunch of those guys. And it, um, the concept is great. Like, I, I love the idea. But having that many uh, parties, like creating your own event and um, then inviting your boys, like it, it seemed like uh, there was a bit of beef here and there between the organizers. Like some people wouldn't get invited to one, they get invited to the other. And it, it was just interesting to see how it kind of all evolved. Like it's cool to see some of these events still going on. And I'm super pumped that they did Royal Hills again this year because that's like the biggest, baddest course of them all. Um, In France. That's right. Yeah. And Nico built that course and they, I get, I think they tested it with motos too. Like yeah. Those jumps I, are big. I was there with Ali. We went and shot it and I invited him. So I went and hung out and they were hitting it with motos, hitting it with mountain bikes. It yeah. was just insanely big. So rad. Yeah. So rad. But yeah, it, it's just interesting to see uh, that the, the dynamic of everybody doing their own events and whatnot. Like I, I like the different styles. I uh, yeah, like cruise fest, you had Aggie's reunion. You had uh, Sorgi's at Retallic. Nico Vink, I had, I think I had two. He had Royal Hills and an, another one, Loose Fest or whatever it was called. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, the one that just happened down in Mexico, the um, Free Ride Fiesta. Free Ride Fiesta. Yeah. And that looked like a lot of fun as well. And that was uh, with uh, Johnny Salido. Was he, was he doing that or who, who did that? Yeah, it was uh, Johnny Salido. I think. Holy Toledo is Johnny Salido. I, I think that's his name. I, I hope I'm not pronouncing it incorrectly. I think so, yeah. I met I met him with um where Gakken introduced me to him and um I was just you know enjoying the view after the uh Crankbricks event in uh in Innsbruck and then he introduced me to him and his sister. And uh both very good looking people, they're both very attractive and uh big smile, super friendly, and uh, they were just friendly people and then and then i saw him ride a bike and i'm like oh wow that guy's a shredder <laughs> damn dog <laughs> yeah the best mexican shredder i've ever seen <laughs> but if he rode a 20 inch bicycle he'd truly 
be a Mexican. <laughs> Sorry, good moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, acceptable yeah thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah but he, he's a badass it seems like he's doing well and yeah. his own event so bummer for rampage for him that he was riding well built a good line and then uh, got, sick. got sick the day before like um i forget some kind of stomach thing it, that's what it sounded like yeah and that, then he couldn't compete that is a real bummer it's like i i want to see this kid ride like i i've heard great things i saw him at the mars hill keep proving grounds yeah and that was exciting. Like a lot of great talent was coming out of there. And were you judging that? I wasn't. No, no, no I just watched the the recaps afterwards. Oh, okay, yeah. But uh, it was sick, man. It's yeah. really cool. I want to see more from that kid. Yeah. Now you've competed in how many rampages? Uh, five. Five rampages. And then you've judged uh, how many since then? Two. Two. Yeah, I don't, I don't like judging that one. Is that like the hardest job ever? Yeah, or? it's just the worst. Like there's. Um, it's hard because all the lines are so unique and uh, it's hard to just compare them toe to toe. And like, it's, it's brutal. And there's such no, a, not just the riding, um, you know, which can be at different levels and, 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 and tricks and, and speed and, uh, but even if they wrote all the lines perfectly, how do you judge them? Even if the riding was a set standard, you know what I mean? Like yeah, it's like, so hard. We, we basically assess all the lines there and every run has a predetermined difficulty. And then the way you ride it is how we judge um, judge it overall. Yeah. But there's just so much division in the uh, the judging there that I, I just didn't feel comfortable. Like I had a lot of my friends like quite upset with me. Yeah. After the last year I judged and I was like, I get it. Like I I don't really want to judge this. It's just it's so difficult. Yeah. And when you have like your your good pals mad at you too, like, dude. Yeah. It's 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 how it no goes. No yeah. And who course. were the other judges? Was Bender and Spangler? And, uh, uh, yeah. Bender, Spangler, Kinrad. I think uh, Nico Vink was a judge one year. Kyle Jamison was a judge one year um, with me. And then, um, yeah, I bailed out. I was just like, I don't want to judge this again. Judging yeah. slope style is straightforward. You have a set line um, and everybody's riding it. It's much easier to pick apart. But um, oh, because you did, you did some judging for Crankworks as yeah, well. Yeah, I've been judging the Diamond Series series for Crankworks, so yeah. all the the Crankworks stops, and um, yeah, just sticking to the the top tier there. Like I've judged two six tricks, and there's something like two hundred athletes going through one set of jumps. That was nuts. Yeah, when you cut it down to twenty riders max down the same line, it's pretty straightforward to figure out. Yeah, and it's fun too. It's like your buddies at the top of the game, absolutely crushing it. And there's, there's never any bad feelings or anything. It's everybody gets it. And if they have questions or anything, like come talk to us afterwards, like let's, let's straighten this out. And we've only had, uh, I think one rider come and complain pretty hard, but, uh, that's what it is. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave it on the field. Oh yeah. yeah see, okay. see you next game. So you have your set numbers, you know, your amplitude and your, your, um, diversity and diversity. Yeah. And, then you have like an overall impression to you? Yes. And so do you talk amongst the judges? Like, like say the numbers don't quite uh, emulate what, or not emulate, uh, put out what you, you're feeling for that run for this rider. Can you adjust it with your overall impression? Because it actually made a, a good impression on you that with style and whatnot, then yep. and what the numbers, you know, totally broken up mean? To mean? Yeah. Cause um, we have one head judge who, is watching everything like we're up and down and um it's not hard to miss something like if there's two tight jumps we basically sit there and watch both of those and then we go down to our steno graphs and uh we write down the exact trick we write down if they dropped a foot case crashed like any of these things or or landed it uh perfectly or through an extra style like there's all these little factors to throw a few enjoy. extra pedals in of course yeah all the all these factors and if it comes down to our overall score, puts two riders at a tie, then we have a conversation. And then we'd adjust scores to uh, put uh, rider A in front of rider B or vice versa. Yeah. Depending on how we feel overall. Yeah. So there is uh, an opportunity to have a discussion and get it figured out. I agree with that. Like, totally. Yeah. It, it has to happen. Like it, to have a unanimous decision between the judges is the best. When there's a, uh, a real division, that's where issues come in. Yeah. And 
and the viewers can actually kind of feel that energy too. Like you, you can tell if there's like a lull in the crowd, like someone gets a score, they probably shouldn't. It's like, Hmm. And you got to figure that out. Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's on the fly. It's quick. And the, the tricks people are doing nowadays are so badass, so technical. Like we are watching everything like switch spins, like switch down to switch bars. Yeah. Like we need to be on top of it. So do you have a replay? Um, can you do a replay? If we need it, we have the option. Yeah. Oh yeah. But okay. sometimes with the, the production, they're like, we need scores now. We, we need to get going. And you're like, do you want a score? Or do you want the right score? Yeah. 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 And I've, I've definitely ruffled a few feathers speaking my mind in that situation. Taking the time to get it right. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do it though. Like we're, we're these people's careers. These are people's, yeah. you know, put, and, putting their body on the line out there. And in addition to that, like we're, uh, we're doing a job as well. Yeah. And I'd like to do it correctly. I'd like to have the respect from the riders for doing a good job. Yeah. And production can um, catch up later. Do you feel when you were competing that you're always, uh, you know, judged properly? For the most part. Yeah. 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 I think so. I, kn I know how difficult the job is. And yeah, honestly, there's, there's riders that are grateful to be there and having a good time and doing their best. And then there's people that complain and I'd rather be in the first category. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I loved it, man. Like we we're doing what we love every day. We're, we're traveling to these events and pushing the sport and progressing and the camaraderie between all the riders is, is something that isn't spoken about that often, but we're all buddies. Like we want you to land it. Yeah. So that's really cool. Yeah. And there's not many other sports that are like that. It is very cool that way. Yeah. Like yeah. if someone goes down, we're, we're genuinely concerned. Uh, or if someone doesn't stick something, if someone does something next level and sticks it, everybody's celebrating. No one's like, oh, damn. You beat me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, I loved it, man. I, I loved competing. And uh, when I felt like my time on the actual competition circuit was done. I, I left then as opposed to being pushed out and being able to segue into adventure travel and just creating cool stories, videos, articles. Um, it's sick. Like I, I kind of took this idea from Anthony Bourdain when he was doing, uh, what was it places unknown or is, and it was that exact recipe. It's like going into different cultures uh, discovering their food, their styles and who the people are just, uh, diving into that culture. And I've been trying to do that with mountain biking, like go, um, ride with locals, see what they're doing, eat their cuisine, like get really get into it. And that's awesome. I'm, I love it. And I just want to share that with people. Yeah. <laughs> do you miss the competition sometimes when you're, when you're kind of rampaging and you're like, Hmm, I think I could throw down this. No. No, <laughs> <laughs> I had a blast. I, yeah. I loved every minute of it. And, uh, I'm pretty pumped on the new chapter. What was it like when you got fifth? That Like, I remember, I remember you boosting over this one, one thing and <laughs> I couldn't believe how high you were. Like, I remember seeing photos of it and I'm like, that's my buddy, man. Like, <laughs> I was proud of you. And then like you, had, you did the Oakley sender, like, like, like rampage has always been gnarly, like totally. And you know, to get fifth is is amazing and um I, w what was it like for you like to to be hitting like airs that big and 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 having to trick them to to get good points and whatnot it was sick like i i really enjoyed it and then when you got to the comfort level to be able to hit things that big and trick them it was nuts it was so sick and i i had never felt so confident on big things before and yeah, I, I don't really know where to go from there. What it's was just, it like on your first rampage? Like your first rampage, you must have been like... Oh, I was terrified. Yeah. I'd never ridden uh, true Utah exposure before. Yeah. And I was used to like the North Shore and like Kamloops and that stuff. And like Kamloops doesn't compare. No. Kamloops is close, but it it's a whole different ball game when you're at the top. You got the helicopter flying above. And you got someone counting down your, your start and you're like, oh, shit. This is real. <laughs> it's go time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But again, like the camaraderie up there, everybody's sitting around chatting. Um, it's, it, that is a feeling I do miss. Like I, I recant that statement. I do miss it. Yeah. It, yeah. It, there's nothing like it, man. 
What bike were you on when you did your first Rampage? Uh, I was on a Rocky Flatline. On the Flatline. This purple, like the first model Flatline. Yeah. Uh, the old Cobra. Head- With the bent down tube? Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was sick, man. Like I was terrified my first year. And then... Uh, my second year I came back with my head screwed on straight and I think I pulled off like an eighth there or something like that. Top and, 10. So you're, inv- you're invited back and, mm-hmm. and yeah. then I got fifth the next one. And then I got like a 10th and then an 11th. And I was like, I'm you had to qualify back then. Like there was a qualifying day. Yeah. The, yeah. Like the first year I didn't qualify. I was, I was too nervous. Yeah. And, um, yeah, for your first experience, I, I guess it's better to be a little safer than sorry, but true. Yeah, looking back on it, I definitely could have opened it up a bit, but it definitely pushed me to perform harder from there on. Yeah. It definitely just set a, uh, a standard that I knew I had to work up to. No, when you hit the Oakley Sender, how big was that? Like, what, the, what you went up to the left variation, didn't you? Um, or did you? The first year there was the Oakley Sender, I went straight off. Um, how the big, big was one. that? I think it was something like 42 or 43 feet lip to lip. Yeah, yeah. And. Yeah, you're you're flying. I'm pretty sure. Who did it first? Dorfling, Dorfling, Guinea did. Dorfling, Guinea did. I did it second, and then uh, I think Kelly McGarry did it third. Um, I might have to check the record books on that one, but yeah, yeah, I I pretty sure Dorfling did it, and then I teed it up right after him. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it was just like, send it, bro. <laughs> Here you go. And then it went right into that rad jump afterwards as yeah. well. How did you feel about like them building wooden features in the rampage? And now now it's like sandbags only in there. They don't you don't really have as many wooden features built up in there. What what was your whole thinking on that? I at the time I didn't mind it. Like it it was the evolution, right? They they were trying to change it up and make built features. But the one thing that um I found odd was if all the tracks that naturally fed into these features um, were taken. It's like that feature was out of your run and you had to find other things. And there there were different features around, but there may have been one that you favored that you could ride your best on. Because for people that don't know, like you, you build your line and you ride your own line. You're not allowed to ride anyone else's line. Mm-hmm. But then they're kind of like, you have to channel them into these built features to get the good points to do the biggest errors. Exactly. And so it was kind of like having riders to kind of yeah, and there are different features around, and yeah. one may have been less favorable. Like yeah. everybody's eyes were on the Oakley Center, uh, those couple of years. Yeah, and if you didn't have a line that fed into there, it there's no chance you're gonna make the steps. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. So I I do like the fact that um, you do have to build your own line top to bottom now. I definitely have more respect for that because you're working your butt off, man. You're out there, sun up to sundown, digging. Uh, you don't get much practice time. And when you do, you're hauling your own bike up to the top of this mountain. Like you're, you're bouldering more or less yeah. with a bike on your back. <laughs> and then you get to the top, you catch your breath for five, 10 minutes. And then it's just like, all right, time to go send it now. <laughs> I don't want to hike back up this. So I hope it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you remember when you were there. Oh man. You know what? I, I had the funny experience when I did my rampage day. We had these youthful offenders, young youthful offenders, hike our bikes up. That's awesome. And so, you know, I gave my bike to some young kid and we all started walking up with our bikes, which was nice. Yeah. And, you know, it's a thousand feet or whatever it is up there. And I got at the top and they started a rampage and then everyone's bike showed up except for mine. And I'm like, <laughs> hey, where's my bike? And they're, they're on rider number one. Rider, I'm, I'm rider number 11 to drop. Yeah. And then they're on rider number three. And I'm like looking for my bike. And there's no, <laughs> my bike's not coming. I'm like, <laughs> oh man. So I, I ran down to the bottom. And I'm running all over the pits looking for my bike. And it's gone. There's no, there's no, there's, there's, the kid's gone. There's no, there's no bike. Come on. I'm like, oh my God. The kid jacked my bike. <laughs> and so I, I gave up. I finally, I just, I, I scoured the whole pits down the bottom and and you know rider they're on rider number four now and i'm like there goes my rampage experience so i walked back to my truck down the road and i was camped down the road and it's you know i'm a few hundred feet down the road and i'm just crossing the road to go to my truck and then in the ditch is my bike no way did the kid make a run for it yeah and i think he was stashed in there gonna come and get it with the vehicle or something Whoa. and so there's my bike and i'm like oh my god there's my bike so i grabbed my bike and i ran to the top 
and I made it in time to to do my run. That's gnarly. But I had to hike my own bike up, and I was like, my legs were quivering, so I'm running, I'm sweating, and then, um, it's it was actually you want to hear the whole story? It's yeah, so, it's so yeah, funny. Yeah. Of course, I want to hear this. So I make it in time for my run. I drop in, and I'm riding, you know, doing my ding, doing my thing, and then the helicopter hadn't flown yet, and so the helicopter finally got up and. It came too close to me because they didn't know how close to it and, oh, wa- and wind washed me with the dust. Yeah. So it filled one eye with dust. Uh, so I did the rest of my run with one eye. And then I came down and I'm, I'm hitting like, you know, 15 foot drops, which was big back then, you know. Sure. And uh, eight, 15, there's an 18, were my biggest drops, I think, in the, in the upper part of the run. And uh, then I get to a series of ridges, which is like an 8, a 10, and a, another maybe 10 or 12 feet, depending on how big you went like three drops in a row and you have to do it at like one or two o'clock and i had little rocks lined up to diagonalize where my run was and mm-hmm. the rocks are gone there's people standing everywhere and i'm like move Jeez. move move everyone's scrambling out of the way so i go <laughs> onto the ridge to go where my line is and this one chick leans out and throws me the horns it goes give her a tippy <laughs> and she's in my way so i kind of have to go around her and it was, like a, <laughs> it was a crowned little ridge. Then I got sucked off to the left. No. And then I went into no man's land and I ragged all through the rocks, did my shoulder. Uh, and then I'm like, oh. and so then I was like, I look at everyone. I go, it's a tough way to make a living, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> everyone laughed. And then there was the big step down. So with my jack shoulder, I set the step, step down and then I knuckled it just a little bit. Ooh. And I bent my seat with my nuts <laughs> And I had worn a uh, a baseball uh, jock, baseball can, yeah. and I dented it. Come on! I think I would have lost my Johnson. Oh my god! If I hadn't had that on. <laughs> anyway, so I bent the seat. I'm like, oh. And so then I look at everyone, and I'm like, I said that joke. If you lose your left ball, is your right ball still your right ball? <laughs> Everybody laughed. And then I sent the final, like you know, sixteen footer into the finish line. And then Westler and his camera crew were in my face. And I'm sitting there with one eye still from the dust. And, you know. Jeez. But just happy to have my bike that got stolen, almost stolen. It was a crazy rampage experience. Yeah. Yeah. It two, sounds like 2002. You, you got the full treatment there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, nothing went right. Yeah, it, was, they, it was funny. It, it seems like they didn't get the crowd control dialed in until uh, until the second generation of rampage came back. Yeah. It was. Yeah. People were walking everywhere on the <clears> lines. And, <throat> you know, you'd have your little stones line up to, to get your direction. And they'd, they'd trample up. People didn't know, right? And that, they'd, they'd walk all over them. And That's still a problem. Like, yeah. uh, like photographers will come up, <clears throat> excuse me, and they'll see uh, your rocks lined up. And uh, I don't know what in the sweet hell they're thinking, but they move the rocks. Oh, God. Or they're walking all over landings. And it's, it's insane. It's just like they don't get it. Yeah. But <laughs> well, all the good ones do, of course. Yeah, yeah. But you just got like... Uh, you got like Joey camera walking up there and he's stepping all over your landing, kicking out the edges, moving rocks out of the way. And you're like, dude, what are you doing? This is my life on the line here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know that we, we've had, everybody's had their experiences with markers being moved and it's, it's dangerous. Like you're at the top and nowadays you literally have at least one or two of your people in dig crew <clears throat> walking down your line, checking it. Yeah. To make sure things aren't moved and whatnot or adjusting it accordingly. Yeah. And that's always been a problem. But <sighs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're definitely tightening up with who's actually allowed on the mountain and just awareness of the whole program. So yeah, that's good to see. Yeah. No, it is good yeah, to see. Good job, guys. I was very conscious. <laughs> <laughs> I was very conscious about, um, you know, navigating the course to do my interviews, you know, for Pink Pike and whatnot. And, um, to get to that athlete, to get to that athlete, you'd have to cross lines. And then there would be like these little goat routes that you could, you know, that people use. Yeah. And as long as you stayed on one of those, you're a good guy. But mm-hmm. if you took a shortcut and walked across someone's landing or, or take off, mm-hmm. you're a bad person. And um, you'd have to be very conscious and, and, and sometimes go well out of your way to make sure you didn't screw with anyone's line. Definitely. And, you know, that's just what you kind of had to do. Yeah, so, but that, yeah. that's that's the art of it, too. Like, these these people are out here uh, crafting these lines. And when they're stomped on and messed up, it's it's a lot of work, man. Yeah. Yeah, they, I don't want to hump back down to the bottom 
and pull up eight more gallons of water to fix this one piece that requires that much water. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of water. <laughs> and it's a lot of weight to like, walk down and hike up. You don't drink any of it. It's not potable water. <laughs> that was a big thing that changed my cave, though, was having the fact that they had like a big reservoir of water with hoses going down. Totally. To pack in your landings and takeoffs. Totally. That changed everything. Yeah. And then they had power tools there for a while. So you're like, people were like chipping away at things. No, people brought those in. Oh. Like people go up to Hurricane or the nearest hardware store. And um, Jeremy, um, God, I can't remember his last name right now. He was digging for zinc and like straight. And he went and bought like an actual or rented an actual jackhammer. Oh my God. Because like uh, when you're building a line, if there's a massive rock that you can't chip away with manually or anything, you work around it. You make uh, the line that fits fits the environment. Yeah. But those guys went and got like an actual uh, uh, jackhammer and they're like chipping out massive pieces Didn't of rock. Did a few people do that now, after that? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next year or the year after, they said, you can't do that anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I think that was... Yeah, they, they, um, they stopped that. They in my time. Yeah. Hand tools only. And then, then they limited the amount of sandbags that you could use as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, because people were... Going uh, crazy. Yeah, it was nuts. They were like slope style rides down the mountain. Yeah, fully catered, like runways all over the place. It yeah. wasn't as raw as it used to be. Yeah. Like what my first couple of years, you basically kick in a line or move something sharp and it's good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it got to... Um, I got so manicured. Which is sweet because you're seeing people do... And people came down on them online and stuff. The comments and whatnot. People were like, dude, they're just slope style runs down the mountain. You know, and the, all the armchair warriors were, were up yeah. in arms about it. Those, those fingers were firing fast. Those fingers are... But when you're there, like, yeah, sure. It might be a runway that someone built, but they might be cork sevening into it. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, you're good. Now we're going to get mad because he did a big trick on something he worked really hard to make. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, everybody's going to have their opinion and it is what it is. I, I tried to stay out of forming opinions or even responding to negative feedback online because you're not going to win. Yeah. There's no chance. Like all, all someone's trying to do is get a rise out of you. Yeah. That's true. And it's basically like online paparazzi. Yeah. You can't say anything. Like if someone's just like, oh, you're a loser. I always write back. Good talk. See you out there. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. Nice talk. Yeah. <laughs> cool. That was a good one. Or, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just kill him with kindness. That's all you can do. Yeah. And like, sure, you might want to say something else, but is it worth it? Yeah, exactly. Especially like this day and age where everything is weaponized against you. You know what I like to do in person if someone ever comes at you is do this the soft. Shh. And you just start talking to really quiet. Just really, you know, oh yeah, okay. And then they're like, they either get some really mad or they or they realize that they're they're getting angry and shouting. Uh, oh, there, there's so many diffusers you can use, but <laughs> overall, everybody's pretty awesome. Yeah, you get the one troll, and you know what? I don't know. Maybe they weren't nurtured as a child. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> It's, it's not my problem. It's not, it's not your fault. No. It's not your problem, not your that's, fault. That's what you just need to say next time someone says something to you. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Like, Don't do this to me, man. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a good psych, uh, psychologist <clears throat> you need to talk to. Um, speaking of the not going to win, as a, I think you were judging by then. You know, our, our buddy Aggie won qualifying three times. And has never been able to, you know, to win the thing. He's he's been on the podium, but uh, he's never been able to win the thing. And you know, for a while there, you know, him, I think him and Andreo, you know, were pretty much stealing the show in practice and whatnot. But he couldn't ever put it together in the finals and win the thing. But when he did do his last run, when he broke his hip there, I think you were judging. Yep. I heard from you and the others that if he would have landed that that three big three that he did. He would have won because his run was insane, and Andreo won, but Aggie's run was insane up to there, and all he had to do was land that last big, huge cliff. Is this a true rumor that he he would have won if he just would have landed that? We'll never know. Anything yeah. could have happened. Yeah, could have stuck it, gotten a flat tire. We'll never know. He we'll had, never he know. attempted possibly the most badass three of all time, and I'm super happy he's all right. And was able to come back from that because 
I closed my eyes when uh, when I saw him tag with his back wheel. Yeah. And went right to the hospital after the event to see how he was doing. Uh, but long story short, we'll never know. You yeah. can't really comment on something like that because... It's the theoretical. Just Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So... Because I think it who was it Spangler was like, I think Spangler actually claimed it. He was like, yeah, if you want to stomp that, that was the winning run. Yeah, those are those are little things that I won't comment on because it's theoretical. Exactly. Yeah, we don't know because you know people were saying the same thing about Andreo and he he had that amazing run where he went off the trail and then came back onto the trail. And then, Dude, like such an exciting run. That mini flip and like somehow pulled together into another one. Yeah, like bang bang. Yo. And then, then he screwed up the the second last jump or the last jump. That's right, the big jump. Yeah, that could have been a winning run too. What was it? It was just like a Superman or something, wasn't it? Yeah, it was he ditched out on some, it? something. He just he just uh, was killing over and over. Yeah, there, but, there's there's tons of things like that, but like yeah, that's true. Who knows? I would yeah, I would have loved to seen Aggie win it at least once. Yeah, but um, yeah, there's so many factors out there. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a different world when you're when you're between the tape dropping in a rampage. Yeah. You you get crazy thoughts. And crazy thoughts. Super crazy thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go and flip this thing. <laughs> I know I was talking with Sorgi and, and and he had his run dialed, you know, pretty early. And then he and he's like, Well, I got it all, you know, I landed everything and I got everything ready to go and I've got my speeds, you know. Now I just need to add a little spice. And I'm like, start flipping stuff. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, I'm glad it's you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he greased it. Yeah, that he won. That was insane. Yeah, again, three three wins for him. Yeah, he's got three Ws. Yeah. 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 I, I, it was a tough battle between him and, and Zinc for the, for the win that one year. That is another good conversation. Did a lot of people come at you? Uh, they did. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, is what it is. Is what it is. It's a unanimous decision. Yeah. So, take it or leave it. All sick runs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you're trying to put it all together, but I can say in that position, Sorgi's run, uh, also Aggie's line, um, just had so much speed, amplitude, and continuous flow to it, and um, of course, Zink did the massive flat drop flip. And then he did a spin down lower as well, but um, he was real close not to stick in that flip as well as that rotation. And we all know he's like one of the most badass riders out there. Yeah. But in the moment, uh, that fluidity, the flip Sorgi put together and the continuation of smooth riding through the course. Uh, yeah, he greased it. He deserved it. Yeah. Yeah. So hmm. that's my two cents there. Yeah. Yeah. And then a legendary party at the Bitten Spur, as always. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> the blackout den. <laughs> uh, yeah. So when you were done competing with Rampage in your mind, you know, what what did you tell yourself? What 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 made you think, okay, I've done everything I wanted to do here. I'm done competing at Rampage. How did that process go? Um I think it was in the last year I had a pretty wild crash. I, I had two pretty wild crashes. Um, the Oakley drop had been rebuilt and I was asking them for just for the dimensions. I was talking to the builders and they're like, it's the exact same, everything exact same. I'm like, it, it looks a little further. Like it looks about five, eight feet further. Like, nope, it's the exact same. So... I went up there to Guinea it. It was the day before the event. I'd already flipped my step down at the top. I'd already spun the drop at the bottom. I just need to get this done. Nobody had hit the, um, the Oakley center yet this year. And, uh, I teed it up and I went off and immediately like you're, you're falling down to like 35 feet. Now I'm just like, wow, I'm coming short. Like I'm screwed. And so I ditched over the front of my bike, tossed it between my legs and full on two foot case the flat top of the landing and just tomahawk. I let my knees give out right away because I just saw my knees blowing out. So I let my legs give out, tucked my arms across my chest 
And I just tomahawk down the lining right into walking. Medics are running over. And I'm just sitting there going, excuse my language. I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they're like, you, you okay? Like, are you okay? Like, what's going on? It's like, went too short and blah, 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 pissed off. They're like, yeah, but physically, I'm just like, yeah, I'm fine. Just, I just rattled. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that, that, that shook me. Like I. How far down was it? About 42, 43 feet. Oh my God. And then your knees were fine. Your, your. I, I was fine that day. The next morning I woke up and I could hardly walk under my own power. Yeah. 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 And I didn't want to drop out of the event. So I, I got someone to help me carry my bike. I was using any, anything as a crutch. Um, for most of the climb, actually, I didn't let anybody take my bike. I was using it as a crutch, like walking by Todd Barber. He's like, how are you feeling? I'm like, good. Right as rain. <laughs> And, uh, I was not, <laughs> Oh, dude. Uh, it was, it was easier for me to ride a bike than to walk at that point. Yeah. And, uh, so I did my runs that day, insanely sore, flipped the step down, landed super deep and blew up in the compression before the next drop. And, uh, I was just like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done here. Yeah. Just rode down the rest of my run and, uh, yeah. I was just like, I had fun. Yeah. It was great. But, uh, that just really rattled me. Yeah. 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 And so talk about sponsors. Like did, did anyone, um, not want to sponsor you because you weren't doing rampage anymore? Did they not, um, embrace the, the, the adventure travel that, that you morphed into, uh, or more focused on, you know, like how, how does that go? Like when you're like a rampage rider and then all of a sudden you're not doing rampage anymore. I, everybody was pretty uh, accepting of it. I don't think I had anybody, I don't think I had anybody say anything negatively. It was just, uh, it's just like, I have this idea and I presented it uh, exactly in the Anthony Bourdain sense that I did earlier. And I, that just, it relates more to the consumer because these are trips that people can actually do. And these are the bikes that uh, the consumer are is riding. Like not many people are going out there and buying a downhill bike every year, except for racers and, and uh, younger generations. When you can throw your trail bike in your bag and travel anywhere in the world and dive into the culture, ride somewhere else and create a story out of it. It lets the average person know that this is a trip they can do. It's attainable. It, absolutely. Yeah. It's like, are you going to go to rampage on your, your five weeks off from working your desk job and send gnarly, gnarly features? No, <laughs> not many people. No. Are. no, you're going to go to Bali and surf and bike, or you're going to go to South America, have amazing steak, drink red wine and have an amazing bike ride. Yeah. Like you can do these cool, uh, refugio or, or hut adventures through the mountains anywhere in the world, or you can go to Utah and send it off a 40 foot cliff. But you have to land it because you have to be at work on Monday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's a very small percentage of, of the population going to do that. Definitely. Yeah. And there's a few of them out there, you know. Of course. But, but yeah, you know, that's a very small percentage. Yeah. yeah. And that I love sense. It. Totally. And so I kind of presented that sense and it was really well received. And so I proceeded. And I've been doing that for like seven years now. Yeah. No, I'd say because five, the bike six. sales of, of these trail bikes, you know, to the downhill bikes is what? Like, Probably ten to one. Ninety percent, yeah. Ninety percent trail bikes, maybe maybe five five percent downhill bikes. Ten five to ten. Yeah, yeah. No, so. it's it's nuts. Yeah, and yeah, downhill bikes are super fun. Obviously, you can just point it down anything. Yeah, but uh, like trail biking is where where the consumer is. Yeah, like that's that's mountain biking, and you can still do super badass things on those bikes. They're so capable now. Yeah. So I love it. So you, you have, as a rider, you know, we, we were on the team together at Rocky Mountain, which had a downhill bike. That's right. Um, and trail bikes. And then um, you went to Focus. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't have a downhill bike. But you were still doing some pretty gnarly stuff on your bike, uh, your tr trail bike, enduro bike, and started to ride an e-bike more and more. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> uh, now you have a new sponsor. That's right. Yeah. So uh, Focus was great. I uh, had a ton of fun with them. They're a great company to work with, but uh, an opportunity came up with Orbea Bikes. And, and they're uh, from where? 
They're from Spain. Okay. Yeah. And they, uh, they sell in North America too. The, like Obsession Bikes just picked them up. Okay. So they have, um, I think they have Corsa and Squamish. Um, I can't remember the bike shop in Whistler, the new one in Creekside. Coastal Culture. Oh, Coastal Culture, yeah. Yeah. And so they're carrying them as well. Um, I believe um, Dunbar is also going to carry them. So that's four shops up to see sky. So just the opportunity to see the bikes you're representing uh, sold in your hometown. Because the focuses were not sold here. No, they were uh, they were basically everywhere but North America. Yeah. And to, to not be able to see the fruits of your labor whatsoever. Yeah. Um, not as satisfying. Exactly. Yeah. So this, And Orbea are actually bigger than people know in Europe. They're massive. Yeah. They've been around since 1840. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So they started in handguns. What? They started in handguns. No way. Yeah. And... Um, I think they pivoted late 1800s um, into uh, road cycling. They were in the Tour de France by 1930. Uh, started making mountain bikes in the 80s, I believe. And now they have like three or four Enduro World Cup teams. Yeah, like, I've, seen, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're an they're, uh, outstanding brand. Yeah. And I'm so pumped to be a part of it. Like the the bikes are phenomenal. Are you their 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 um, only free rider? Um, I guess so. Yeah, you'd be their marquee free rider, I'm sure. Yeah, they picked up Evan Wall through the um, the Pink Bike Academy. Yeah, and he's a little more of a racer. Okay. Um, they have four Euro Enduro teams, and uh, then me as the free ride guy. Awesome. And the bikes are so sick, man. Like they're aesthetically pleasing. They're light. They're so capable. Like I'm riding the 140, uh, the Orbea Occam right now and like sending Brutus on this thing. Like it's butter. You're doing Brutus on a 140 mil bike? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like it, I was blown away. I had a good ride with uh, Steve Vanderhoek and he's just like, oh, we should go send Brutus. And that's for like 15, 16 down, 20 out. And I was just like, you know what? Let's go. And I had like a little Fox 34 on the front. Uh, 140 front, 140 rear, and it was butter. No problem. Yeah, I did it three times. Yeah, I'm like cool, huh? Sick. Let's wow. go. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I can't wait for the the rayon to come. That's 160, and I should have that in a week or so. Nice. Stoked. It's that, it's that time of year, you know, where yeah. the new bikes and new products are. New bike in. day. New bike day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I know that you started riding an e bike more and more in the last couple of years. I love them. Are, are they have had an e bike too? Yeah, they have two. Oh, nice. They have the Rise, which is the uh, e-bike version of the Occam, uh, 140 mil, and it's 35 pounds. What? Light motor, light battery. Yeah, so it's um, the e-bike assist, just lighter, more efficient uh, motor system. Oh, wow. 35 pounds. That's ridiculous. And then they also have the Wild FS, which is the 160 model, which is the standard Bosch engine. Yeah. And that's a little heavier, but at 160, who cares? It's, yeah, the, yeah. it's the eco shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> like I said in the last uh, <clears throat> show, like Wade Simmons said, having an e-bike is like having a chairlift in your garage. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I ride from my, uh, my place down lower Lonsdale up, uh, from up the climb trail to the top of upper oil can or not upper can, sorry. Um, seven like seven secret. secret. Yeah. It takes me 44 minutes. Say so Lonsdale key. To the top of the trailhead. Yeah. 44 minutes on the, on the e-bikes. That's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. nuts. No fumes come out. Only when I fart. Yeah. And it's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. And people also chirp e-bikes. I'm like, just, just try it. Try you it out. You don't know unless you, unless you try it. Yeah. You, you don't, don't know, know unless you bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love my e-bike. I, I, I'm sold. I, I, uh. Yeah, this you're is all, fun. You're all over yours. Yeah. We've been out e-biking together. Yeah. And it's so much fun. Like, it's just like riding a bike. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And people just beef on it so hard. And you're like, oh, wait. It tends to be less and less these days, though. A hundred percent. Than than a few years ago, even. The winds are changing. Yeah. 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 And it's it's just cool to see. Like you you leave the car now. And I don't think there's a better application than going and shuttling yourself up. And having an unreal ride down 
with no vehicle. With no emissions. Exactly. It just. Yeah. And the bikes ride amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Give them a go. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. E-bikes. And they're basically floating our entire industry. So. Yeah. And it's only going to get bigger too. <laughs> for sure. You know, I don't think regular bikes will ever go away. No. But I think e-bikes are here to stay for sure. So. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a great addition to the fleet. Like, why not? Yeah. If you have an extra seven grand kicking around. <laughs> Somewhere I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's in my sock. <laughs> I lost the life. <laughs> no, they're. I love them though, and they're capable. Like yeah. I, I had one bike fail on me last year, right before I was going on this GoPro shoot, where I was determined to do some pretty big moves, and so I ended up just bringing my e-bike. And um, well, you I, ended up doing like the the train gap. Yeah, you rode uh, down Farwell Canyon, down one of the steep chutes. That's right. Um, you did a few gnarly things on your, on your e-bike. Yeah. And it's, they're capable. Like, it's just, you need to, um, reprogram your mindset to just be like, it's, it's a bike. Yeah. Just makes uphill easier. Yeah. Yeah. And the cool thing too, uh, one thing that pe people don't really notice, but the extra weight, uh, gives you a lower center of gravity. So you have that initial weight of the bike on the tires already, therefore giving you more traction. And that's one factor that people don't really take into account. It's like you're going into corners and you have a lower center of gravity now and you're just tacked into these things. You're going down steep rock chutes, you immediately have more traction. So it's stable, stable with more traction. Totally. Yeah. No, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I love the feeling actually. I've, I've ridden the same trail with, with, you know, an analog bike and then the e-bike and I can hit it harder on the e-bike. Not just because you're pedaling into it, just pure gravity. Yeah. Just because it, it feels safer. It's really cool. Yeah. I yeah. love that feeling. I know. And yeah, totally. like you said, I'm with you. Like you said, normal bikes will never go anywhere, but it's nice to mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. Add to the quiver. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> have you got uh, Brianna, your, your your lady out on a on a on an e bike? I have. We um we rode our e bikes to the top of Grouse for dinner one night in the summer. Oh what? Yeah. Rode up um the top of mountain highway up the from fire roads up to the top of grouse had dinner yeah and then we just cruised down all the way home that's awesome it was rad and yeah. like she she's capable of doing that pedal but she wouldn't no. unless you slapped an e-bike under her yeah and it was sick and then it's fun so much fun yeah yeah nice little date night yeah. to the uh, the peak of vancouver so you're <laughs> married now for those that don't know um jeff got married two summers ago yeah, like two and a half years ago now. Two and a half years ago. Um, great wedding. Super fun. Um, but, uh, you know, very, very nice lady. Very beautiful lady. W what's it like? Does it change your uh, mindset being married? And, and how, how is it like? Um... Honestly, I think uh, I think things have almost relaxed. Like we've been together for 16 years. And uh, as soon as we got married, I think she just chilled. Like immediately, I was just like, okay, I got to go on this six week shoot. And she's like, have fun. Like she, I, I don't know if the mindset before was still our relationship was in question or what, but I feel like um, throwing a ring on it just like chilled things out. And yeah. it, it was never in question, just to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, um, it may have been like just the extra mental security. Yeah or something just having this uh this handcuff on my finger <laughs> <laughs> i put mine somewhere special and it's so special i can't find it <laughs> well i know a great shop called cavalier gas town where you can get a new one for a, a very good price oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> no shameless plugs here <laughs> <laughs> that's we've talked a little bit about the past you know we've talked a little bit about the present um you know it's it, covid times um, pretty crazy, you know. What what does the future look like for for you? What's what's you know you're gonna continue shooting? Like I, I remember last year when it all started hitting, you know, we were told to like not go too crazy and don't you know um, potentially totally. go to the hospital and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you were still hitting ladies only and stuff, which is not super gnarly, but still pretty gnarly. Yeah, you know, for the average bear. But you know, like you do that in your sleep, so I guess there's no problem for you. And you know, you did some great POVs, some great content your channels are going up, you're getting great numbers. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a kind of a crazy time right now. 
it's it's really crazy and i feel that we are very fortunate living in bc like we have some of the best riding in the world and there's so many cool places around here that i haven't even visited like i've been traveling i've been flying around the world for 17 years now for about six seven months of the year so during prime time i don't get to visit these places in bc and this year was pretty eye-opening like when uh we were allowed to uh, bounce around a bit it's just taking advantage of it like staying in tight quarters keeping your distance masking up but exploring some new riding and uh Honestly, like I, I knew about a lot of it, but there was probably three times as much that I've never heard of or seen before. Yeah. So there's still a lot more to explore. And when things loosen up a little bit, when temperatures get a little warmer, obviously I'm going to bounce around for the first little bit in BC. And then when uh, the world opens up again, I'm going to be on the first flight out of here. <laughs> but we, like truly we just have to play it smarter like wear your mask do your part like don't go and don't go drinking downtown don't go to granville like these idiots you see on the news and things like that like what are you doing man yeah you're gonna slow this down for everybody you're like, asking for it yeah like for, new, for others and yourself yeah like new zealand's completely open right now they're having concerts they're having bike events like we're the only ones missing out like what, how hard is it to just wear a mask? Like how badly is this Im impacting your freedoms to wear a mask? Yeah. You're literally just postponing your actual freedom. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, we've never seen anything like this, like in our lives. So no, this but is, last uh, time was the Spanish flu, I guess. Yeah. And literally a hundred years ago. Yeah. And I noticed looking back in time that these things, you know, the bubonic plague, the Spanish flu, the black plague, they're all, they're all a couple of years. Are the bubonic and the black plague not the same thing? I don't know. Is that true? I thought they were. Oh. Yeah. Bubonic just sounds kind of cool. It does sound cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, bubonic. do you know where that stems from? No. And I could be wrong, but from what I learned was it basically turns you into a hemophiliac. So you can't clot um, uh, wounds. Oh. And what it did was it would open sores up under the skin. So you get uh, bubbles of blood called a bubo. Oh, wow. And that turned into the bubonic plague. I think that's also the black plague, but I definitely could be wrong. Yeah. I don't Nasty. really attend history class. Well, I hope we don't get that. Yeah. Dude, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Zombies uh, running around everywhere. God. Yeah. Zombie apocalypse. Can you imagine if that actually happened? Oh. Like I watched Shaun of the Dead last night. Oh yeah. Great movie. Yeah. Great movie. But yeah. just thinking about uh, this crap, like it's, can you imagine if zombies were a real thing? Like, what would you do? I would, I would like, I would put big tube bumpers on my tundra and I would like seal the windows and I would get shotguns and bows and arrows. Yeah. Like I, and I'd stack up on a whole bunch of craft dinner. <laughs> I honestly think I'd stock a ton of food and just go live on a houseboat. On a houseboat? Yeah, because they can't swim, right? Can they, zombies, right? They just fall apart in the water. Well, maybe they'd walk under the water, but if you're deep enough, they can't get you. Yeah, yeah. Just don't drop anchor and let fly. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I do, but like that's that's kind of my thinking. Like You see people hiding in high-rise buildings, and it's like, cool, use the fire exit? Yeah, <laughs> they, they got you trapped. Exactly. Yeah, that's like you're like a tree raccoon. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go on a boat. Gee, well, hopefully we won't have to deal with any zombies. Or like, I don't know, maybe hijack the Goodyear Bloom. <laughs> yeah. Let's float around for two years. <laughs> <laughs> Sky dumps every day. <laughs> yeah, totally. Bungee jumping. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Almost got me. <laughs> <laughs> look at my... Uh, yeah. Oh wow, cool man. Well, yeah, this has been a great talk. A little, a little of uh, the old days. Nice. Thanks for sharing your insight with us. Of course, we got into zombies too. I, don't I know. know. I don't even know right. where that came yeah. from. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's, a, it's crazy times. It's crazy times. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But, yeah. Well, I'm glad to see that you're loving skiing. You're loving biking as always. You're running healthy right now, and um, look forward to going shredding with you. So, likewise, pre appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks and for having me. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. And uh, thank you very much, Jeff Galovich, Rock and Roll Brother. Thank you. Right on. Nice little album.